Good morning. Thank you for joining us here at Mount Sinai Missionary Baptist Church, 1667 South Lauderdale, Memphis, Tennessee. And we pray that you will be blessed uh, for your efforts and your time this morning. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we uh, come this morning celebrating Mother's Day. And we ask that you would increase our honor and value for mothers because of the co great contributions that they've given repeatedly throughout time. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Uh, our text today comes from uh, Psalms 131. Again, that's Psalms 131, and there's only three verses there. We'll read all three of them, but we'll focus mainly on verse 2. Verse 1 says, O Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. O Israel, hope in the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. I want to use uh, verse 2 and, uh, well, the uh, th verse 1 through uh, 3 to talk about the greatest lesson of a mother. The greatest lesson of a mother. And by the way, the greatest lesson that a mother can teach can turn out to be one of her greatest bl blessings. There's only the mention of a mother in our text today. There's no mother's names that uh, is specified, but yet this is a weighty mention that all of us have to learn from. We are looking at the view of the mother from a Hebrew context. How mothers are viewed in their value tends to change through time and their ge geographical location. The function of the mother in the family in biblical society was clearly a male-centered world with the family structured along patriarchal lines. Some have claimed to find traces of matriarchal uh, in the ancestry of Israel, saying this does not deny the important contributions that so many women have made. The mother's primary role in the Israelite family was to bear and nurture children, a function that oft time began as early as 16 years of age. Motherhood was honored and coveted and painful was the lot of the Israelite woman who was barren. The Israelites had a high regard for faithful motherhood, and it's indicated by the biblical writers utilizing the words and concept to express the idea of the deepest loving attachment, especially found here in verse 2. Isaiah 49, verse 14 and 15 says, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. That's what they were saying about the Lord. But the Lord uses in verse 15 the example of a mother to prove his point. He says, Can a woman forget her nursing child? that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, but yet God says, I will not forget you, Israel. Maybe we are concerned and, 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 and wonder sometime about the self-giving love of God. In Isaiah 66 and 13, we find God speaking again in his own defense. He says, as a mother comforts her child, 
So I will comfort you, Israel, and you will be comforted in Jerusalem. And then Jeremiah 31 and 15 speaks of the profound sorrow when a bereaved mother finds herself losing a child. And this was in, in the time when Israel was in exile. And God again uses the sorrow of a mother to let Israel know that he had a plan and that he would make sure that the Israelites in some form would return home to Israel. Consequently, children were expected to obey and honor their mother. It was not uncommon for the mother to take the initiative in directing the affairs of the family. For instance, Sarah insisted upon the expulsion of Hagar against Abraham's misgiving. And even after initiating the idea of Abraham going to bed with Hagar, Re Rebekah instigated the shift of the blessing from Esau to Jacob. Abigail interceded on behalf of her household. Bathsheba intervened on behalf of her son Solomon. And it appears that the primary responsibility for instructing the children lay with the father. But it is noteworthy how frequently the book of Proverbs speaks of the mother's instruction. In Proverbs chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 6, verse 20, chapter 30, verse 17, and chapter 31, verse 1. Timothy was apparently instructed in the faith by his mother, Eunice, who was taught by her mother, Lois, in 2 Timothy 1 and 5. But what are the significance of the term weaning found in verse 2? There are two things that are important. The first one is humility that weaning teaches. And then the second one is hope. So weaning teaches a child humility and hope. Let's look at them both for a minute. The simile of the weaning child is a beautiful picture of the meaning of humility and maturity. Hebrew children were weaned at an age of three or four, and this experience marked the ending of their infancy. But most children do not want to be depraved of mother's loving arms and satisfying breast, and they feel rejected and unwanted when they are weaned initially. But after the crisis of birth, each child must eventually be weaned and learn the first lesson in the school of life. And that lesson is an important one. And it is the, the fact that it, the lesson is growing up involves painful losses that can lead to a wonderful gain. Whether you want to hear it again, that sound is so good to me, I'm going to say it again. Growing up involves painful losses that can lead to wonderful gains. And that's an experience or lesson that you can, you can learn and accept at an early age, but it's useful for the rest of our lives. The Hebrew word wean means to complete or to ripen, or to treat kindly. The English word may be a cont contraction of the Scottish phrase, we won, or it may come from a Teutonic word that means to be accustomed. Maturing people know that life is a series of gains and losses and they learn how to use their losses constructively. If children are to grow up and not just grow old, they must be able to function apart from their mother. 
here I'm sitting in my study and I want to, I almost say, somebody ought to say amen. If a child is to grow up and not just grow old, they must be able to function apart from their mother. This means weaning, going to school, choosing a vocation, or probably marrying and starting a new home. They must learn that there is a difference between cutting the apron string and cutting the heart string and that these separations do not rob them of a mother's love. God's goal for us is emotional and spiritual maturity. And God sometimes has to wean us away from good things in order to give us better things. Abraham had to leave his families and city. He had to send Ishmael away. He had to separate from Lot. And then he had to put the promised son that God delivered, Isaac, on an altar. Their life holds some painful weaning. Joseph had to be separated from his father and mother and his brothers in order to see his dreams come true. Both Jacob and Peter in the New Testament had to be weaned from their own self-sufficiency and learn that faith means living without scheming. The child that David describes in our text, wept and fretted, but eventually calmed down and accepted the unavoidable. The word wean or, or, or calmed describes the calming of the sea, for instance, or the farmer leveling the ground after plowing it. Things settling down for life settling down for being used by the Lord. And this comes instead of emotional highs and lows. The child develops a steady uniform response, indicating a giant step toward the quest for maturity. Successful living means moving from dependency to independency and then to interdependency, always in the will of God. To accept God's will in the losses and the gains of life is to experience that inner calm that is necessary if we are to ma become mature people. The second one is hope. Hope is anticipating the future. Infants do not realize that their mother's decision is for their own good. For weaning sets them free to meet the future and make the most of it. The child may want to keep things as they are, but that way lies in immaturity and tragedy. When we fret over our uncomfortable past, we only forfeit a challenging future. In the Christian vocabulary, hope is not hope so. It is joyful anticipation of what the Lord will do in the future based upon his changeless promises. Like the child being weaned, we may fret at our present circumstances, but we know that our fretting is wrong. Fretting is much like grumbling or complaining. We know it's wrong. And all the time, so often, and I'm speaking from experience, when we decide to accept the unavoidable, that is when we get on the road 
to a successful, mature life. Our present circumstances are the womb out of which new blessings and opportunities are born. Romans 8 and 28 says, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Let me share a story with you and then I'll let you go. There was a preacher named Ian McLaurin. This great preacher of the word of God once visited a home and found an old woman standing in the kitchen weeping. Her husband was out in the barn somewhere, so preacher McLaurin waited for him to return. And he observed that the woman was weeping and she wept her eyes, she wiped her eyes with the corner of her apron. And when the preacher asked her what was the matter, she told him, I have done so little and I'm so miserable and unhappy. Why, asked McLaurin, because I have done so little for Jesus. When I was a little girl, the Lord spoke to my heart and I wanted so much to live for him. Well, haven't you, asked the preacher. Yes, I have lived for him, but I have done so little. I wanted to, to be of some use in his service. What have you done? She said, nothing. All I've done is wash dishes and cooked three meals a day and taken care of the children and mopped the floor and mended the clothes. That's all I have done all of my life, and I wanted to do something for Jesus. The preacher sat back in the armchair and looked at her and smiled. Where are your boys? He asked. She had four sons and had named them after biblical personalities. She said, you know where Mark is. You ordained him yourself before you sent him to China. Why are you asking me that? He is there preaching for the Lord. Well, where is Luke? Questioned the preacher. Luke, he went out from your own church. Didn't you send him out? I had a letter from him the other day. Then she became happy and excited and as she continued her story. She says, a revival has broken out on the mission field. And he said that they were having a wonderful time in the service of the Lord. Well, where's Matthew? He's with his brother in China. Isn't it fine that the two boys can be working together on the mission field? She says, I'm so happy about that. John came to me the other night. He's my baby and he's only 19, but he is a great boy. His mother said, I have been praying, he said, Tonight in my room, the Lord spoke to my heart about going to help my brothers in Africa. But don't be, uh, don't worry about me, mother. The Lord told me that it was okay if I stay here and look after you until he takes you home to glory. The preacher looked at her and you say your life has been wasted in mopping floors and sewing socks and washing dishes and doing the unimportant task? You've served the Lord in a great way. What do you mean, preacher? He said to her, you weaned your sons and look at the great work that they are doing because you weaned them from you. 
Mary, the mother of Jesus, had to wean him. That's why when he wasn't with his with Joseph and Mary, he asked the question when they found him, know ye not that I must be about my father's business? We can never be about our heavenly father's business unless we've been weaned, unless, unless we matured in life, unless we've reached that pinnacle of, of hum, humility and hope in the Lord. Jesus had a father that was a carpenter, but he didn't construct the cross. He died on the cross one Friday. He didn't dig the grave, but he was buried in one, a borrowed grave. And he rose the third day morning and is sitting right now at the right hand of the Father, making intercessions for, for us. No wonder his earthly mother Mary made the statement that she was favored. She was a mother that was favored because God chose her to bear our Savior, and she had to wean him. But man, what good hands she put him in. Thank God for mothers today and every day. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these uh, words of encouragement for mothers. We pray now that you would give the increase that uh, uh, husbands and children will all be, always be supportive and encouraging to the mothers that play such an important part in our lives. We pray now that you would help us to accept the weaning moments in our lives, knowing that they would lead to great challenges and great opportunities to serve in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, that's it for today. Not for today. Again, uh, happy Mother's Day to all. And uh, children, do something good for your mother today. Take care. We'll see you next Sunday. The Lord's will.